You can have one. You can have two. You can have three. I mean, you can go a little wild and crazy. Howdy neighbor. How is your garden growing? Today in my garden, well, we are continuing on with the transformation of taking my front yard from totally chaotic to a dreamy cottage garden. We are into our fifth major project of this transformation, and we are going to be adding a arch trellis to the western side of my front yard. You may be thinking, wait a minute, isn't that an arch trellis behind you right there? Yes, it is. That was the fourth project, but now we have the much more challenging project because this one we actually have to take out an existing arch trellis and then put in the new one. Now, first up, you might be wondering, why, why are you taking out the old arch trellis? You have one there. Why do all the effort, the work, spend the money? And I would totally agree with you if it wasn't for the fact that that thing has got a ticking time clock on it just completely collapsing over. Almost all of the legs have completely rusted out. And we have put some band-aids in place that have held it together for the last two years and a couple hurricanes, but it has got such a significant tilt at this point. Um, it, it is, it's, 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 it's happening. That thing's collapsing. There's no, there's nothing I'm doing to stop it at this point. We have to replace it, not only for aesthetic reasons, but actually for safety reasons too. So since we were already gonna put a trellis in on this side, we might as well, you know, just like get a matching set. But here's one of the things that's kind of the tricky, questionable part about this one, is that the vines that we have planned to put on this one, like I, I knew what combo I wanted to do over here. Over there, we, ha we have an existing vine that I, I don't hate. I actually like a lot. But with us taking it out, I'm not sure whether it's gonna survive. So that trellis right now is being held up by what's called jasmine, which is a Florida friendly plant. So it's not native to Florida, but it is considered on the friendly list of non-native plants. And it's pretty much green year round, but there are certain times at the end of winter, early spring, where it just gets covered in white blooms that are just so gorgeously aromatic. I love it. And so this is leading to the question of if, the plant doesn't survive, or if it does survive, what are we gonna put on this trellis? So one of the things I wanna think through, and you might enjoy thinking through with me, is some different vine combos. Recently, I did a video on like 10 best bold blooms, but here's the thing with a trellis, like you don't have to have just one vine on it. You can have one, you can have two, you can have three. I mean, you can go a little wild and crazy, not chaotic, but you know, you know, you can, you can mix and match a bit. So it got me thinking like, do I want the same combo or do I just want to let it be Jasmine or do, or do I want to do something completely different? So let's first talk about the combo that I'm doing on this arch trellis. This was project four, the Easter trellis. So this combo was based off of work I had done years before we had built a trellis, it collapsed during a hurricane. But one of the things I really liked with this combo is coral honeysuckle and ocean blue morning glory. I think these are, oh, I just love it. Now here's the thing. Coral honeysuckle, if you're new to vines, I feel like great starter vine. It doesn't get wild and crazy, both on the trellis. It's easy to maintain. It also doesn't send out like runners and reroot all over the place so that like <laughs> you're mowing your grass and 20 feet away, poof, here's the plant. Cause there are some, there are, there are some that do that. But this one, it, it stays pretty contained. So it's an easy one to start with. And what's great about it is in my area, it blooms pretty much late winter, spring, summer, fall, and into the early part of winter, depending on how warm that year is. And then it's evergreen. And then if it is a colder year, the leaves turn to like a reddish color. So we like that. And then because it's got that bold tropical coral look, and I know this is a cottage garden and I've been staying away from tropical plants, but I do have a couple tropical sec, like I have a tropical section in the front yard. So I'm okay, because I just like this combo is I wanted to put Ocean Blue Morning Glory. I've had Ocean Blue Morning Glory for years. It is not like the spot that I had it in, but it kind of wove its way over to the old trellis. And that's when I first saw the combo and I was like, man, I love this. So that's what we're doing over here is Ocean Blue Morning Glory and Coral Honeysuckle. And what's also great about the Ocean Blue Morning Glory is similar to the Coral Honeysuckle, it blooms throughout the same times of year. So it's kind of basically, it won't really bloom as much on the coldest days, but basically for me, I'm a zone 10, late winter through, through spring, summer, fall, and then early winter, as I say, late winter through early winter, but I was like, well, that might seem confusing, <laughs> but basically most of the year, other than like the very coldest part of the year, it's gonna be blooming. It doesn't have cute leaves, when it's, you know, really cold out. Um, but that's okay, because the coral honeysuckle would like make up for it. So I feel like for having like consistent, big, bold, 
beautiful blooms. That's like a really good combo. Now another combo that I had and actually was the original combo on here was coral honeysuckle and maypop passion vine. It's really good because it has kind of these very green luscious leaves and it fills in way faster than the coral honeysuckle. So if the coral honeysuckle kind of got a little damaged, the maypop can quickly fill in and get it green pretty quick. It's also got big, beautiful purplish flowers. The challenge with this one is because it's a host plant, I felt like, especially in the beginning years, it definitely, because of the caterpillars, it just took a lot longer for us to get flowers. And we just didn't get as many flowers as like what I would see with an ocean blue morning glory. What I liked about it is it kept pulling in butterflies. I got lots and lots and lots and lots and lots and lots of butterflies. A watch out for me, and the reason I don't wanna do it on that side, is this one does send the runners, while this neighbor doesn't care. Actually, he likes it. He comes and will collect seeds from my wildflowers and my native plants, and then he propagates them in his yard. So he's not, he was never mad, like if it popped up. He would just be like, ooh, I'm gonna dig some up and transplant it around. He has fun with that. My other neighbors, they kind of like the classic grass look. So out of courtesy for them, I wouldn't do it on their side of the house. If I ever did it again, I would do it with my neighbor, Mr. Cliff. So that's something to consider is like, if you ever wanted to do Maypop, no matter what combo you would do with Maypop, um, it's, it, it's gonna pop up far away. That can be really good if you have huge spaces, like if you have huge chain link fences and stuff like that, you know, you can get it to really spread quickly. Yeah, not for this space. This is too narrow for where I'm gonna be doing it. So those are the combos I've done before. Here are some other combos that I've either seen from other people or y'all have told me. There's a nursery called The Nectary. They've done Man in the Ground and Key West Morning Glory, AKA Sky Blue Cluster Vine. This is like a really cool combo because they both get like smaller. They're both in the morning glory family, but they get the smaller bloom. So unlike like ocean blue morning glory, which is like, you know, you're gonna get a flower that's this big, you're kind of more this big. They put out a lot of blooms and both of these will bloom through the warmer times of year, at least in my area and the kind of like the central Florida area. So you're kind of more that summer, fall for I think man in the ground. And then sky blue cluster vine is kind of everything but winter time of year. So this is kind of a cool combo. And if you throw in a white flower, then you got like, <laughs> and they're blooming through the summer, you could kind of have that like red, white, and blue, which would be kind of fun. Cause I know some people like to do the red, white, and blue for 4th of July. Just a crazy thought. I don't know. I know that I would do this one. Um, cause I'm kind of looking for more blooms that go year on and on and on. But I do like the idea of these kind of little delicate flowers. For me, if I were gonna do this, I would do it if I had like a smaller trellis area. You know, like maybe like a small wall trellis that's maybe like two, three feet across. And like I have some height because the man in the ground's gonna die back. But for me, not for this space. Though I kept thinking about it because I was like, well, the jasmine survives and I've got those cute little white flowers, but they don't, I don't know that the blooms would quite overlap. They wouldn't for man in the ground, but they would for the cluster vine and the jasmine. So. That's kind of a cool idea. Now we're doing a lot of bold blues and along my house, like kind of the front facing, you know, we've got these corals, we got this blue that's gonna be coming in with the project that was next to the garage, we'll have pale pinks. And then there's a bunch of wildflowers, which has got a whole myriad of colors. But one of my favorite, I don't know if it's not my favorite color, but like yellow makes me happy and yellow flowers really make me happy. So then I started thinking like, what if I did yellow over there? and it would combine two yellow vines. Cause see, honestly, Carolina Jessamine is so pretty. It is like so pretty. I don't know. I've been thinking about it and I like yellow. And at this time of year, there's not a lot of yellow flowers, a little bit. So this one's gonna kind of bloom as you go from winter into like, basically we're in winter in Florida, but like we're warming up and, and it has a huge range. So if you don't live in Florida, like it's whenever you're going from like, we're probably not gonna have frost damage and we're starting to warm up. It might be first spring or fake spring or fall spring or whatever we call that, but that's when this one starts to bloom. Um, I do have things that are yellow in my garden. I'm looking right now. I'm like, oh, doing sunflower, starry Ross and weed. They're all blooming. <laughs> all my established ones are all blooming. So there is yellow in the garden. And soon I have a tree that will have a lot of yellow, but I don't know, a lot of yellow could make me happy. And if you combine it with wild alamanda, those two together, combined forces because wild alamanda kind of blooms basically the rest of the year <laughs> so caroline just means like boom yellow and then the other one comes in with like boom yellow but for the rest of the year money native vines can have talk to be toxic to pets but like wild just means like known for being like especially toxic um and where that is now my dogs sometimes we might might walk through there but not really but my neighbor's gate is right there. And if the blooms were to fall over in their area, they have their dogs in their backyard a lot of the day. 
it would be too easy for them to accidentally eat them. And I wouldn't want that to happen. So, mm, some other ones. And that's kind of like the tricky part is like you could throw in, there's some hose plant type vines. So they don't, like you can mix them in. So one is white twine vine, which is, it's not a milkweed, but it acts enough like a milkweed that monarchs use it as a host plant. And sometimes we don't have enough space or enough milkweed <laughs> for, for the monarchs. So this is a way you can get like a lot of milkweed. If you got like some vertical spacing, if you don't have as much like horizontal space, or if you want to just like have a lot of monarchs, that would be really cool. And also, of course, corky stem. Corky stem, I like, it's not It's not a big, bold bloom. But you know what? If you're in an English cottage garden, like this, I feel like has such an ivy look to it. And it deals with like the semi-shade and the shade pretty well. So you got like a shadier arch space. And also, I feel like any of these combos, you could just throw corky stem in because it'll just like wind through. And the, <laughs> the butterflies don't care. They're like, hi, I sense corky stem. I have corky stem growing through a shrub over there. One of the shrubs that's going to come out as part of this project. And like does not does not care does not care it just is like i'm coming through the shrubbery oh i got this suggestion right here combining ocean blue morning glory you got your big bold blue flowers and then combining it with moonflower moonflower is one of the ones that kind of it blooms at the end of the day ocean morning glory it a blue ocean blue it's such a long name the ocean one it's blue you got what i'm saying that one is definitely, it blooms in the morning and then like it kind of like closes up, fades towards the end of the day. So what they, they were saying was that by having both of those, because they bloom most of the year, um, they're, they kind of have then like blooms all throughout the day. Very exciting, cool combo. And for small parts of the year, you know, they actually with the sun, the way it is, like they actually have time periods where they have the blue and the white, which I think could be really, really pretty. Before we make this final decision, the, the big question is, will the jasmine survive? So first up thing we need to do is we need to uh, get the other trellis out. So that's what's up next. We are trying to figure out what's the best way to go about this. But our general game plan right now is we are going to try to remove as much jasmine as possible. Second, we'll release the T-post from the trellis. There we go. Third, who knows? interesting is I'm guessing is that old home owners number one built the trellis, old home numbers number two built the sidewalk and they built it right over the trellis too. So now what our option is is that we get to go see if Ben's dad has a tool that we cut them because we're not digging three feet down to get cement out. Well, one way or the other, we we got the post out or they got cut underground and and that's where we have to leave it today. Because it's late, I have to eat dinner and clearly I have to take a shower. So we're gonna leave it there and then we'll come back and figure out where we're gonna put the new trellis slash build the new trellis and then what plants survived and that this has been a very challenging process would be an understatement. So the other day we got the trellis out. I'm going to take you and show you because I don't I don't know what I showed you. 
before. <laughs> we all just collapsed in exhaustion. So here we go. So here is where the trellis used to be, right here. You can see we were able to actually pull out some of the posts, some we just had to cut down into the ground. Um, it is such a hot, hot mess. So the nice thing about the previous owners is that they were doing the right thing. They wanted to make sure this trellis could go the distance, it could survive hurricanes. So they actually cemented the posts down into the ground. Um, and you might say, hey, in the other project, you didn't cement yours in the ground. Yes, because trellises break down eventually um, at a rate much faster than cement. So there was cement feet into the ground. So some of these posts came out if we were able to dig out around the cement. The part of the problem was is some of them, like this one, this one is, um, we can move the cement, but it was un it's partially under the sidewalk, which proves that this sidewalk was put in before, <laughs> was put in after this trellis, because as you tried to pull it up, you could hear the cement scraping underneath. So we just called it a day and cut it. Just cut it right there. Which brings us, speaking to cutting, there's the jasmine. I'm not sure if this side's living. There's not evidence, I don't know. I mean, you can see we dug so much around the root system trying to get these metal posts out. I don't know if this can survive. We will see. This side, you can actually see it's still here. So <laughs> there was some quirky stem passion vine. Remember earlier I said it will grow up through everything? Well, here is actually how thick apparently some of that quirky stem is. I'll need to finish pulling that out, but there you go. Um, but here we go. This is still alive. So its root system is uh, back here. So depending when we go to put the new one in, this might be okay. I can actually jump up and over the trellis. So we got that alive. But this one was a beast because it also had a piece that came over like this. So not only did it have the legs that were here, it had legs like way out there. I guess because this was on the property line, they didn't do this on this side because like that's the neighbor's sidewalk. When I say it's like really close to the neighbor's yard, you can see like it's a very thin strip. So maybe that'll survive. Maybe the Western Jasmine will survive. I don't know. It's super questionable. I'm not going to depend on it. So we'll plan like it's not going to survive, but we will have some Jasmine coming up on the other side. So we, we could do red, white, and blue. If we want to make it symmetric, we could have coral honeysuckle, ocean blue morning glory, and a little bit of Jasmine. And for that very specific time of the year, we could be super patriotic. <laughs> Regardless of what we're going to put in at this point. Now we just need to put in, just put it, put in the trellis. Oh, and the other other nice thing is it's overcast today. And usually while we all would be like, oh, we want blue sunny skies. No, no, when we're doing big bills. We do not want blue sunny skies. We want overcast skies that are not gonna rain. And today is perfect for that. So let's get going on building a trellis. <laughs> So we've gotten the trellis built and I think you guys saw before we went and took a break for lunch, we started to put the stakes in. I don't know how much you got to hear because my neighbor, they were going to the car. Your son was, he was, he, you could tell, 
she was ready for a nap. <laughs> so I don't know how much crying was in the video. <laughs> um, but poor little guy got down for a nap. And now we're back out here after lunch. And let's talk a little bit about where we're placing everything. Okay, hopefully you guys can see where the blue metal stakes are. They've been measured out. So what Ben and I were thinking is it was gonna be similar placement to where the old trellis is, but not exactly the same. One, because we don't wanna hit the cement nonsense and metal nonsense that's still in the ground. And two, you know, from time to time, because that, that jasmine was old, it would get up into these gutters. Oof. I definitely need to pressure wash everything, but not today. Um, and so therefore we're coming slightly forward. We were also trying to make it kind of symmetric with the placement relative to the road as the other trellis over there. Because if you can kind of see the garage pops out and then there's this sidewalk and then there's a trellis. So if we kind of follow along, if <laughs> this house jutted out more, on this side and it was symmetric then this would be about right here so we moved it a little bit more forward this allowed us to avoid all the metal and nonsense that's in the ground still but it means we're probably going to be digging holes exactly where what's left of the jasmine and then we have to finish building the trellis and then we have to go pick up the plants depending on whatever we decide and then put the plants in so let's do this next part which was the hard part this was the really hard part of the last one well it was kind of la really all kind of hard for the last trellis but this next part because those posts need to go about three feet down and with the water table with where it is at this time of year it's about three feet down okay so we're gonna start digging these holes first since we have a lot less leeway and give versus this side we have more clearance from the sidewalk so we'll start here and thus begins the hole digging Ben's gonna finish putting the holes into the trellis, do the final securing stuff. And I'm gonna go get the plants, and then we're gonna dig some holes, put the plants in, because I think what we're gonna go with. Oh, yeah, did I tell you what we're gonna go with yet? Well, I'm in the vine section and the cool thing is is the plants we're gonna add to those trellises are in bloom So I want you to see this color combo because I don't know if you'll see it once it's installed for a while So here you go. Look at this Look at that. Oh my gosh. Can you imagine that? Can you imagine? That is too pretty. So ocean blue morning glory and coral honeysuckle here we come <laughs> what an amazing transformation. It's been from a broken, 
dilapidated troll trellis that I just can't wait for it to fill in with the vines for blooming. And if you've enjoyed this project and you wanna see all the projects that are part of the cottage garden series, you can go check out this playlist right here. It has all the videos from the big plan for the entire front garden, plus perennial wildflowers, drought tolerant plant, all sorts of things. There's so many projects. And if you wanna learn more about native vines with big blooms, check out this video right here. Okay, I'll see you soon. Bye.